you walk into a room with several ship models in it. You are immediately pulled in and you go from one model to the next. Some you look at for only a brief time, others you tarry over, and as you do, you begin to notice things that were perhaps missing from the other models. Maybe it's the scorch marks on the triworks of the whaler, or the worn down threshold to the cabin of the fishing schooner. And it seems the longer you stay, the more you notice, until your surroundings begin to fade and it's just you and that vessel. If you've ever experienced this, then you know what a compelling impression is. It is that thing that compels us to stay focused on our subject and draw from it whatever impression or knowledge or emotion it might evoke. For the next few minutes, we'll take a look at why certain models effectively convey that compelling impression. So how does one go about creating a compelling impression of an actual vessel? Well, we're going to deal with that, at least some aspects of it today. But first, let's start right from the beginning with a formal definition of a compelling impression. A ship model should strive to convey a compelling impression of an actual vessel within the confines of historical accuracy. Now that's a definition for the phenomenon that I discussed in the intro. And that definition was arrived at by Rob Napier, master model builder and restorationalist and conservator par excellence, and Bruce Hoff. It's their definition. They codified that intangible thing. Uh, Rob, if you ever have a chance to see Rob's work, don't pass it up. Um, he is one of the most knowledgeable and thorough ship model builders and restorers and historians and academics that I have known. His knowledge on all phases of anything waterborne is encyclopedic. Um, and he's also quite an author. He's written two beautiful books. Uh, this one, which, des which describes the process of restoring the Valcanessa for the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, a 10-year project that uh, he chronicled in this book. And this book deals with creating a compelling impression of an antique ship model as opposed to a vessel because that was the approach that was needed for this particular project. And he also wrote Legacy of a Ship, which dealt with the restoration and conservation of the one of the few Admiralty Board models in this country. Actually, there are about 30, I think, in the... Um, Crabtree Collection at Annapolis, Maryland. And this book chronicles that very detailed and very inventive uh, way of dealing with an antique model that needs special attention. So these two books are really, if you can find them, they're well worth the money. And they were published by Sea Watch Books Limited, and they are in Florence, Oregon. And I will put links to their website and their email in the description below. You really should go out of your way to find these. They're well worth the price. They have a wealth of knowledge and uh, definitely worth your time. So, back to our little video of compelling impression. So how does one make a compelling impression of an actual vessel within the constraints of historical accuracy. I would say the biggest starting place is scale. If you're not accurate in your scale portrayal, then everything else will be off. Um, and scale has to apply to more than just the mathematical ratio that you use to figure out how big to make a specific part. Um, it has to do with certainly that, but it also has to do with choice of materials and choice of colors. Um, let's just take color very quickly. When you're looking at a vessel, 
Um, and let's use my model of the Kate Corey. Oh, the Kate Corey was a 75 foot whaling brig. And I built a model of the ship at 148 scale. And when I stand in front of that model, I have to be two and a half feet away from that model to see the whole thing end to end without shifting my eyes or my head around. Just standing and looking at it from a distance, how far do I have to be in order to see the whole model? And in the case of that model, it's two and a half feet, 30 inches. And when you multiply that by 48, you wind up with about 130 or 150 feet or something like that. You'd have to be 150 feet away from the actual vessel to view the whole thing end to end. And this is going to vary depending on your sight. Some people have more peripheral vision than others. But basically, that's a guideline. And if you take that into consideration, now you're looking at that vessel not from two and a half feet, you're looking at it from 150 feet, half a football field away. And what that does is it introduces the atmosphere. And that's something that we generally don't think about because the atmosphere is supposed to be invisible and to the naked eye it is. But what you're actually looking at that vessel through is the humidity in the air. It, it's the, that atomized moisture that diffuses and refracts light that changes how we perceive the colors. So if we were to take that and scale that back, we shouldn't use, if the hull were black, we shouldn't use just straight black. It's gotta be some mixture of black and maybe a little neutral gray or maybe a little blue or maybe a little brown. It depends. And you have to take that into consideration when you're, when you're painting your model. You can't use the actual colors dead matched on on your model. It will look garish, it will look too bright, it will look it will, it will just look wrong. So you have to scale back all your colors. Um, grays in, you can use gray to do this and you can control whether a, a color advances or recedes by the kind of gray that you use. If you use a warm gray it will come forward it will be a bit more prevalent. If you use a cooler shade of gray, something with a little bit of blue mixed in, it will recede. So if you want your colors to recede a little bit, make them a little bit cooler. Make them a little bit more washed out. Um, gray is something that I add to a lot of my colors. Uh, and a lot, of, a lot of the colors I mix dependent on the scale that I'm working in and the vessel itself. So that's a little bit on color. Um, as far as dealing with scale, uh, it can be a pain to keep having to go back to the, you know, go back to your calculator or your computer and say, all right, what is 1 48th of 7 and 5 eighths? Well, for about 5 or 10 minutes in Excel, you can make yourself a little scale conversion sh uh, spreadsheet. Here I've got one for uh, 1 24th scale. And in it I have in eighth inch increments from a quarter of an inch all the way up to 12 inches. So if I need to know what that uh, 1 and 5 eighths would be at the particular scale I'm working in, I can look over and say, oh, it's 68 thousandths. Ah, problem solved. How do you measure that 68 thousandths? The best way. I mean, you can do it with a, you can do it with a ruler, but you really can't. The best way is with a pair of calipers. And whether you use a pair of old-fashioned vernier calipers or the new, the newfangled digital calipers, doesn't matter. Just use them. Uh, back in the day when these first came out, this pair right here in my hand cost me $125. And I really had a tough time, uh, you know, justifying spending that. But I did, and I was glad because I've used those for about 18 or 19 years now, and they've never, never failed. Today, Pittsburgh, you can get these at Harbor Freight. If you pay full price, you'll pay $19. If you get them on sale, you could pay 10 So 
and they do run sales. So I would seriously consider looking into these are maybe not as good, but certainly for our purposes, they're more than adequate. They don't work quite as smoothly as those, but that's about the, the worst thing you can say about them. They'll give you an accuracy that will pay off in dividends on the finished model. So those are a couple of tools that you can use right off the bat to keep you on scale. Uh, the materials that you use, they really have an effect on the overall look of the model. So many things can take you right out of that compelling impression. So you have to be careful of that while you're choosing your materials. And this goes whether you're scratch building or kit building or some combination thereof. Um, if, you're, if, you're, uh, if you're kit building, one of the places that a lot of models fall down on are the blocks. And I'll put a, a still photo up on the screen of a bunch of various kinds of blocks and you'll see the differences between them. And the ones that are going to be most effective on your model are the ones that look like actual blocks and not just a block of wood with a hole in it. Um, and you'll see examples of all of that. And the other thing that you need to do is make sure that that block and the line that you're using interact with one another in, an, in a harmonious way. That line has to come into the block, enter into the swallow, lay down on a shiv, and come out the other side, making a nice, smooth U-shape. If your blocks don't do that, you have to make them do that because what will happen if you don't is the line will come up, it will make a hard bend, almost a 90 degree turn to go into the hole on the block and another hard 90 degree turn to come out. And what you'll wind up with is a line that has much more bulk, a line in a block that has much more bulk than it really should have in order to look correct. And there'll be still photographs of this as well on the video. And you'll see the difference between what a bad block looks like and what a good block looks like. And while we're on the subject of materials, let's look at woods. Now, I've had model makers come up to me, and especially guys that do like small craft, uh, small sailing boats and things like that, they'll come up and they'll say, Oh well, I built a, I built a model of a Hershoff 12 and a half, and it's got, um, it's got mahogany seats in it, and I used mahogany on my model too. Well, mahogany is really not a suitable wood for model building. Its grain is much too big and much too pronounced. Uh, same thing goes for oak. If you wanted to make oak combings on a beetle cat boat or a Hershoff 12 and a half or a Wiano Senior. Uh, all, of, all of those boats used red oak uh, primarily as the wood for their combings. If you were to use red oak, you would see nothing but grain. And what you need to do is scale your woods back. On this one, I used white holly. Um, I probably could have used maple instead of white holly. Uh, but I used holly on it and it comes out looking quite nice. The grain is small, tight, and more or less in the grain pattern that you would find on oak. It's a little bit finer than oak, but better to be on the fine side than on the coarse side. So, and you'll see pictures of that too. And you'll also, I'll also show you what it would look like if you used real oak on a model this size. Uh, I've, used, I've made examples of this combing right here in oak, white oak, not red oak. I didn't have any red oak in the shop when I did this. Um, maple and holly. So you'll see all three examples one after the other and you can see which one looks best. It really it really is either the maple or the holly. You can, it, it's a toss up.
let's take a look at blocks and the scale appearance. At the bottom of the photograph there is a scratch built block. Well it's in the process of being scratch built and it's made the way a real block would be made. Two cheeks, two fillers. Uh, the cheeks have an internal groove to receive the strap and it has a shiv. And these are obviously the most labor intensive to make but they could also be the most convincing if done well and very possibly even the most rewarding. And on the right of the photograph you see three blocks that were made from uh, blocks of wood. There was a central slot cut down the middle, then the upper and lower holes were drilled for the shivs and they were eased, all the shaping was done and uh, in the top one on the right you can see just the hint of a strap there so uh, they can be quite convincing too. In the middle section of the photograph you see three wooden blocks. I think they're all made out of boxwood. Um, the lower one, the larger one, is a block that is commercially available. It's available through I believe Siren Models in Connecticut and they do have a website and I'll try and find it and put it in the description down below. Uh, the upper blocks, well let's go back to Siren for a second here. That block actually is really quite nicely made. It's a little bit oversized in its width for a shiv block that size but that can easily be taken care of just by sanding down the sides and you'll see more about that later. Now the upper blocks sadly are the blocks, the type of wooden blocks that come most often with the commercially available kits. Um, sad to say they are next to useless uh, and it's what almost everybody uses maybe because they don't know any better or they can't think they can get more satisfying looking blocks. I'm not quite sure what the reason is but I see more of these on models than anything else and it's a sure way to kill that compelling impression of an actual vessel is to use those blocks. In the upper left hand part of the picture you see three cast blocks and they're available through Blue Jacket Ship Crafters in Searsport, Maine. Uh, if I were to use commercially available blocks these would be the blocks I would use. Uh, they're not without some need of attention. Uh, sometimes there's flash around the casting. You can see some on the Beckett on the treble block. Uh, there is a a uh, shiv pin in the side view of that block. You can see that. That shouldn't be there. And there's also a seam. All of that has to be gotten rid of. The straps and Beckett's have to be drilled out and formed the way you need them to be. Uh, but you wind up with the most realistic looking blocks out of any of those uh, on the table there. So that would be my first choice if I were to make not make blocks and uh, buy them commercially. Now we're going to go out into the shop. So here we are back in the shop and we're going to take one of the blocks that you saw in that photograph and we're going to put it to the test. So let's see how close it actually comes to the block dimensions that we would need if we were building a particular model. In this case that model would be the Kate Corey, the whaling brig from the 1850s, and the plans that I used and the specifications for the blocks that I used to make for that model were developed by Eric A. R. Ronberg Jr. back around 1970-71, something like that, when he built his model of the Kate Corey. He developed an entire table of dimensions for all the blocks and the dead eyes and the fair leads and everything. And that's what I used. Um, and that's what we're going to use here today. So I have a 12 inch single pulley block. It's 12 inches long, surprisingly. Four and, a uh, four and one eighth inches wide. Each piece of the shell and the filler and the slot are one and three eighths inch wide. That's how we get that overall dimension of four and an eighth. And the opening for the shiv 
is 9 inches. It's also 9 inches wide and we have a 6.5 inch diameter shiv and an inch and a quarter pulley, uh, pulley axle. Excuse me. Uh, so those are our full size dimensions and we're going to work in 148 scale because I have a 12 inch block here and 12 inches would be one foot. We've got a one foot block. <clears throat> so that works out well. So let's do that. I'm going to measure it up with a pair of calipers and I know you're not going to be able to see it on camera at this distance. So uh, you're just going to have to take my word for it. So the first thing we're going to do is measure the length of the block. So and it comes out to 0 0.252 thousandths, 252 thousandths. That is just a hair over our 12 inch block. Pardon my bad penmanship. So we're off to a good start. Let's see how we do on the width, which has to be 9 inches, which in our scale is 3 sixteenths of an inch or 0.188. Here I've got 184. So again, really nicely done. 0.184. Just slightly under and if you want to be, if you're going to be over or under, you really want to be under, not over. Uh, next dimension is going to be the overall thickness of the block. Let's see what we get there. Now we're looking for four and one eighth inches, which in our scale is 0.89. So if we come anywhere near 0 0.88, 0 0.87, uh, 0.9, excuse me, 0 0.0, all of those, 0 0.088, 0 0.89, 0 0.9, 0, uh, that'll be good. But what we have here is 0 0.1105, or let's call it, let's just call it, let's drop the 5 off, it's 0.1105. One zero. Now that's quite a bit different. That's uh, we're looking at um, twenty thousandths at least. So that's a little bit of a problem, but it's actually solvable, fairly easy. Okay. Next thing to do is we're going to need to measure the slot, and we're going to try and measure the width of of the slot. We're going to measure it for length and width and that's going to be a, a bit tricky because these are big calipers and I've got a little block. So let's see. All right it looks like the length of the block is 0.157 which is seven and a half closer to seven and five eighths which is a little undersized. And again, and so that's a little under what we really needed. But better to be under than over. Okay, so let's see if we can measure the width of that slot. Point zero three seven. So point zero three seven comes out to an inch and three uh, an inch and three quarter and we're looking for an inch and three eighths. So we're off but we can fix that to some degree. Because the whole block is an inch out, we can take a half an inch, a half a, a half a scale inch off of each side and bring that down and live with the oversized 
slot for the shiv. So actually this would be a good block to use. Um, one or two more things about blocks, block selection, and looking at the details of the block. If you look here, this is a, uh, as I said earlier, it's for an externally stropped block. It's got a V-groove at the top and the bottom to accept the line that you're going to strop the block with or strap the block with. On this, on this particular little block, that strap block, that strap groove rather, runs top to bottom. It wouldn't do that on a real block, but in this case it might help to uh, mitigate the added bulkiness of the strap itself. So when you go to strap it, um, you know, and this speaks to this problem here. You're an inch out. If you're going to strap it, you're probably going to strap it with a half inch line, perhaps. So that half inch line at this point is ten thousandths of an inch. So that means you're going to have ten thousandths of an inch added bulk on this side and this side. And if it's served, which it almost always was, you're going to have to add the bulk of the serving in as well. And if you are doing a quarter inch serving or less, you're going to be adding on another three and a half to five thousandths of an inch per side. And all that, blocks, all that bulk starts to add up and it becomes bigger and bulkier. So if you start out an inch over to begin with, you're really asking for trouble because now you're going to wind up with this block that looks like it needs to go on a diet. And that's not a good thing because all the blocks, whether, and if you did them all that way, let's say, let's say that there were a dozen blocks in fairly close proximity to one another on your model. And I'm just picking arbitrary numbers here. Uh, a dozen blocks, they're all one inch over to start with and they've had the bulk, the added bulk of the straps you can look at that and you'll know that you're only a one inch out on that one detail. But anybody else looking at it will see this rather portly piece of mechanical, mechanical engineering there that doesn't look quite right. And they won't be able to put their finger on it. They won't be able to point to it and say, oh man, that's stropping. Eh, I don't know. Maybe the block's a little over. They won't say anything like that. They'll just say, it doesn't look right. And they won't know why, but it won't look right. And if they say that, if they're thinking that in their heads, then you've already lost the compelling impression. The compelling impression is something that is really easy to knock people out of. And it's, it, it's, it's, if you're looking to convey a compelling impression, you have to pay attention to all the details and try and get them all into scale and consider them all part of the model. And as a matter of fact, you should probably be considering this a model all by itself. You should be able to take that block with the strop and the, and the serving and all of that and maybe even put a line through it, put it on a little stand and put it in the case under glass and it should serve, it should stand as a model all by itself. And if you look at it that way, then you're not making a model of a whaling brig that needs a 12-inch block. You're looking at it and you're saying, today I made three models, three complete models of a 12-inch block. And that will help you to keep that compelling impression alive when your viewers look at the model. Whether they're accomplished marine artist assessors or not, because they'll get it. They'll, they'll look at it and they'll say, wow, that looks real, you know? So it's very, all of these things, all of these details are cumulative. Um, I haven't even touched on rigging materials, what kind of rigging line to use and how to treat it. Uh, that's a whole subject all by itself. So that's enough for now and this will give you the idea that these are details that you need to pay attention to and if you don't have the specific knowledge 
of how a block was specifically used on your ship. Just look up practices of that time. There are plenty of references. Uh, block making after steel is one. Um, Harold Underhill, uh, Rigging the Clipper Ship and Ocean Carrier, I believe is the name of the, the book. And he's got tons of tables for spar dimensions, block dimensions, what blocks to use with what kind of line, uh, how to rig them. Plenty of information out there and really no reason not to seek it out because it's so easily available, especially with the internet. So let's see what else we've got to deal with with compelling impression. So here we're going to try a little side-by-side -side comparison. I have two blocks that are very similar to the block that you saw in the other photograph and the one that I used for the in-shop demonstration where I measured it up. And from that measuring we know that this block is basically correct except for the thickness. So what I thought would be interesting to do is to take one block and leave it completely alone, take the other block, make the corrections on it, and see what the difference is when it comes time to actually use it. So I'm going to make the corrections on one and I will strop both blocks with a piece of 19,000s line. It's a little thin but it, you know this is just a demonstration so it really doesn't have to be all that accurate. Although a block this size would use a line about 25, 26 thousandths and that's what I'll use to run through there as if it were a piece of running rigging going through a pulley block. So the first thing we're going to do is reduce the size of the walls and chamfer the shiv holes so that it looks a bit more like a real block in there and hopefully we'll let the line lay a little bit more naturally. And there you can see the result. So here you see both blocks have got their ties on them and they've been rigged with 26 thousandths rigging line and in order to keep the line in place I used four clips, two on each block, to uh, weight the line down. And that's the only thing weighting the line down at all. So let's go back to that picture of the line as it ran through the block. The block on the left is clearly the one that's been altered. The block on the right is not. That was the block as it came out of the little pouch that you buy it in. I think the difference speaks for itself. And keep in mind here, the only thing that is giving the line any shape for either of these two blocks and lines are those four little clips holding the, the line in place at the end. So you can see with just no effort at all you get dramatic results, dramatic differences in the treatment of the two blocks. And this alone should be enough to convince anyone that it's definitely worth the effort to take these blocks and accurize them. It takes very little time and the rewards are so much greater than the amount of effort that you put in. So we'll end this video here and I'll just say thank you for your attention and I hope that the concepts that we've discussed here are things that you can actually use in your modeling and maybe it will get you thinking in ways that will improve upon the things that I've put out here which is really kind of the point of the exercise. So if you found this information helpful please remember to hit the like button, hit the subscribe button, leave me a comment I'd love to hear your feedback, and thank you, and see you again soon.